Everything you need. Everything you need to know. Uh-huh. So welcome everybody. Hey. Welcome everybody. This is Justin. This is part of the Realtor Association Fox Valley event. This is not quite 10 o'clock yet, but I just thought we'd do a quick systems check. You guys hear us and see us, at least the screen in the chat box or in the Q&A, just kind of write down that you hear us so you we can move on successfully. Show up with the number up here. Yep. It should just the same like you saw. Morning, everyone. Uh, this is Richard Association of Fox Valley. We are doing the What's New in the 7.0 contract today. It is just a very little after 10. Thanks, everyone, for showing up. 
Um, just a couple of bits of housekeeping before we get started with this fun stuff here is a couple of things. In case you guys were not aware, this is not a CE class. If you're going to, we do teach a CE class, check the calendar, make sure you sign up that one. So we actually do have a CE 7.0 contract and other stuff. Think your credit for at the same time. Two, if you have uh, the paper in front of you, that's fine. If not, we're going to be showing you it on the screen so you can take your notes that way. Three, if you guys have questions or anything like that, there is a Q&A section. You usually find it on your top of your screen. There's also a chat box. You probably will see either on the top or the right-hand side of your screen. Please don't hesitate to ask. There are a bunch of us here, so we'll be able to kind of follow along, either answer on the side or answer them during the thing. A um, couple other things for no keeping. Everyone in this room, we're realtors or staff professionals. We are not attorneys in this room, so we're going to be taking what we have in here. We do not say anything in here based on contract law. If you have those questions, it is always best to ask your attorney that you have presence for you. Uh, I think that's it. Anything else I forgot? Anything I didn't say? Are you recording it? We are recording it. Actually, you're going to record it now. They didn't hear all that fun stuff. They don't need to hear all that stuff. Go up top. You know, over to the... Where is that? Oh, no, it says recording. Good. We're good. We're recording. Um, so we are recording this, so if you have other people that need to see it, you will see that in there as well. Um, so with that being said, my name is Justin. I'm just kind of a facilitator. We'll be answering questions around here. We have Lisa and Chris, part of the office. If they want to introduce themselves, they can. And we have Carol. She's the one that gets to do most of the talking today. And you get to learn lots of amazing things for someone that sat on the panel. So that is awesome for us. Yeah, you guys, Lisa, Chris, you guys want to? Hello, welcome. Hi, welcome. Thanks for attending. Look forward to helping you this morning. Well, awesome. With that, guys, we will get beginning with this right now. So we'll hand this over to Carol. Good morning. I'm Carol Weinert. I've had the privilege of sitting on the committee that develops and modifies this contract for many years. We meet when there have been a sufficient number of requests from member boards for modifications. We met a little over a year this time um, and determined that this time we needed a whole new rewrite for the contract. I'm going to walk you through the changes that we've made. You'll have an opportunity to ask questions. Um, I hope I can clarify some things. Uh, I'm going to do this line by line uh, you'll have the highlighted copy on your screen. We started on line 10 and we added on line 10 multi unit. Now, there was a rationale behind that. Uh, each time this committee meets, we expand our geographic reach. When we do that, we have members who practice a little differently. For quite some time, we've been trying to get the Chicago Realtor Association to make this their main contract. This multi-unit provision was something that they felt very strongly about. Uh, there's also a multi-unit addendum that's, attra that's attached to this document. That was done primarily for them. Moving along, on line 11, we added if designated parking is included. On 13, we added if designated storage is included. These items were expanded to deal with condos and townhomes uh, where there's more issue with is, is it general parking? Is it specific parking? What is it? We hadn't addressed storage before at all, so that's new ground for us. Next, in the personal property items, we've added some things. In column two, we added wine and beverage refrigerator. Also in column two, we added or we changed, it says water softener unless rented. We use that same rationale in line three with security system where it says unless rented. We did that because our members were marking that when they wrote the contract. 
Okay, you're the buyer's agent, you're writing the contract, there's a water stop, you marked it. There's a security system, you marked it. And before it said owned. And when it developed that it wasn't owned at closing, the agent was the one who ended up paying for it often. So this is kind of a protective measure. So water softener and security system unless rented. Okay, you're going to get them unless they're rented if you mark it on the contract. In the first column on line 28, we added water heater. Now I'm hard pressed to explain to you why we needed to add water heater, but um, there was feeling that sometimes people took the water heater. So uh, the other thing it says is that you check or enumerate. So if there were three water heaters, you'd write the number three. Uh, we've also added in column four, hardscape. And each time I've done this presentation, there have been questions about what hardscape is. Hardscape is a number of things that wouldn't apply to this contract. It's sidewalks, it's patios, it's that type of hard surface. But it's also the water fountain, it's the bird bath, it's the uh, outdoor kitchen. So if you're marking hardscape, you at some point in this contract are going to have to be more definitive about what you meant when you marked it. On line 29, uh, we made, uh, I don't know, an inconsequential change maybe uh, it uh, that says other items included at no added value. It used to say at no additional cost. We've done this for the lenders. You know what happens here. You write all the extra things that the buyer would like on that other items included. And the lender says, I can't have that on there. So then you have to take it off. Uh, we're hoping that the words at no added value will <clears throat> make that a little easier for our members. What we've done next is we've reformatted the contract and we've talked, we've, we've grouped the information the way it would flow in the transaction. All right, now before I get to purchase price, on line 35, before we talked about if a home warranty applied, you completed a subsequent paragraph. Now, what we're wanting is all the information about the terms of the contract on the first page as much as we can do that. So we want you to indicate. So you're gonna make a check if there's a home warranty. You're still gonna complete an optional provision, but you're gonna give this notification on the front page that there's a home warranty. All right, we deal with the purchase price. Then next, when you think about how are we gonna pay for this now, all right? So we're going to have a purchase price and payment, all right? So a part of the way we're gonna pay for it might be a credited closing, all right? So we put that up front. What happened in the past was when you talked to your client on the phone about this offer that you had received, you talked about the purchase price, you talked about the closing date, you talked about the financing, and sometimes you didn't get around to that back page of talking about the credit of closing. So we put it up front. Um, we've changed a little bit the way we talk about the earnest money. Um, and I'm gonna read that to you. Earnest money of blank shall be tendered. I'm on line 41. Um, uh, earnest money of, of blank shall be tendered to escrowee on or before um, blank business days after date of acceptance. Then it says additional earnest money, if any. The problem we had before was people thought they had to have additional earnest money in every instance. So we've kind of clarified that a little bit. We have a date for when that's going to be tendered. Moving to page two. Real quick, uh, Carol, one of the questions that was asked was up top. Can you go back to right there? 
where it says other items included at no added value. The question is, has there been, has this been run by lenders to see if it will still be an issue? Um, I think it's going to continue to be an issue. Uh, I think that you're going to need to have an agreement between the parties that comes outside of this contract for those personal additional personal property items. Awesome. Thank you. Okay, moving to, moving to page two. Um, on line 46, we talk about in the event the contract is declared null and void or is terminated, earnest money shall be dispersed pursuant to paragraph 26. We didn't talk about early on in the in the document before what happened if something went wrong. So we're right now giving you notice on line 46 that if the contract's null and void, the money's going to be dispersed in accordance with paragraph 26, which we will get to. Um, on line 50, under closing, um, so we have who, um, closing will take place at the office of the title insurance company, its underwriter, so that's new language, or its issuing agent that will issue an owner's policy of title insurance, um, whichever uh, is situated nearest the real estate. We added underwriter because some of these title companies didn't have nearby locations. And you might sell a St. Charles property but you might end up closing in Rosemont because that was the nearest location to the title company. So by including language about the underwriter, it is conceivable you could also then be closing in St. Charles. Um, on line 53, we've added, now remember that we've expanded this document so it may be used in multi-unit transactions. And so now when we talk about possession, possession shall be deemed to have been delivered when the seller and all occupants, if any, have vacated the real estate and have delivered keys. Okay, so we've added the language that says there might be people living there besides the seller. Um, next, we're going to talk about the finance. So we said, we talked about how we were going to, what we were going to pay. We're talking about what the earnest money was. We talked about the closing cost credit. Now we're going to talk about where the balance of the money is coming from. So maybe there's going to be financing. All right. Now here, and I have to say, this was like a belt and suspenders on line 55. It says initial only one of the following subparagraphs. And then we tell you what those subparagraphs are. Why do we do all that? Well, because in the financing paragraph before, we had some funny things happen. We had some blanks that were left blank intentionally, and then some, none of you, I'm sure, but some agents would fill in a closing date that was 45 days from the date of contract, and in the 6.1, there was a blank that said if left blank it was 60 days so that created a conflict so we took the blanks away and in their stead we added language on line 56 that says not later than 45 days after the date of acceptance or five business days prior to the date of closing whichever is earlier the buyer shall provide written evidence from buyer's license lending institution confirming that buyer has received loan approval. Okay, so 45 days. Now, if 45 days doesn't work for you, then under the attorney review provision, you're going to have that modified. But we've taken those blanks away and we've set a, a timeline. On line 60, we added uh, USDA. That's um, United States Depart Department of Agriculture loan um, that hasn't been in the contract before. These are loans granted in rural areas. Um, it's a good program. Good program. You can finance 100% of the purchase price. Now you're going to talk to your lenders about this because there are some income guidelines um, and there are some there are some areas where these loans will apply. They they're not universal. 
um, on line 64. We've kind of expanded here. Um, what, what was happening was buyers were oftentimes delaying their loan application until after home inspection issues were resolved. This was troubling. So we've tried to advance, address this. All right, so we've done that a couple of ways, and I'm going to start on line 64. Buyer shall pay origination fee, closing cost charged by lender, and title company as pro closing fee. So we've set out what buyer's obligations are going to be here. Then on line 71, we say, upon the expiration of 10 business days after the date of acceptance, if buyer has failed to make a loan application and, and pay all the fees required for such application to proceed and the appraisal to be performed, seller shall have the option to declare this contract terminated by giving notice to the buyer not later than five business days thereafter or any extension thereof agreed to by the parties in writing. Uh, thereafter and the thereof, of course, are our legal phrases there. Half of our committee, by the way, was um, comprised of attorneys, and they represented various bar associations throughout the area. All right, so you're, you're going to get financing, all right, and so then you're going to be in the marking paragraph A. If you're not getting financing, and this is going to be a cash transaction, we've moved from the optional provision section, the paragraphs relating to cash transactions up into the main body of the contract. Okay. So cash transaction with no mortgage starts on line 84, and then we have, turning the page, uh, on page three, we have cash transaction with a mortgage allowed. Now on line 106, we, uh, and you understand, cash transaction with no mortgage is just what it says. I can pay cash, I'm going to pay cash, uh, no ifs, ands, or buts. Cash transaction with a mortgage allowed says I can pay cash, but my uh, financial planner may not think that's in my best interest. So I may get a mortgage. So we did a little clarification on lines 106 and 107. The buyer shall pay title company escrow closing fee if buyer obtains a mortgage. Provided, however, if buyer elects to close without a mortgage, the parties shall share the title company escrow closing fee equally. So if I told you I might get a mortgage and I went ahead and got a mortgage and the contract wasn't contingent on it, I'm paying, as the buyer, I'm paying the closing fee. If I told you I might get a mortgage, but decided I wasn't going to get a mortgage, then we're splitting the closing fee. Easy peasy. All right, next on um, line 119 under prorations, we added pre-purchased fuel. This could be bottled gas, so it could be LP gas, could be fuel oil. Um, also in proration, on line 125, we, we've expanded this a little bit and we added disabled veterans. Since 2015, um, after the 6.1 was written, uh, the government initiated um, disabled veterans uh, provisions uh, as it relates to real estate taxes. And depending on the level of disability, it is possible that a veteran might not be paying any real estate taxes at all. You'll be able to tell this by looking at the real estate tax bill. If it's not clear, you'll call the county treasurer for clarification. Um, online 127 and 128, I'm going to read you the sentence and then I'm going to talk about it a little. The, the proration shall not include exemptions to which the seller is not lawfully entitled. What does that mean? 
Well, if I bought a house and it was my principal residence, and because of that, I received a limited homestead exemption. And then subsequently, I turned that home into a rent. But that exemption wasn't removed. I was actually receiving an exemption to which I was not entitled for that property. We're not going to expect prorations to be based on that exemption which was inappropriate. Moving right along. I'm on page four with attorney review. Uh, remember, half of our committee are attorneys. This paragraph took months and we met five hours at a time and one month we'd make a decision and the next month we'd change it. So, I'm going to I'm going to read you some parts of this. Um, we have the same options we had before. The attorney may approve the contract, he may disapprove the contract, and we have these two other provisions, the C and the D, that we had in the past. But we're hoping with more explanation, um, these will be more appropriately used. Under C, the attorney may propose modifications to this contract, except for the purchase price, which proposal shall be conclusively deemed a counter offer, notwithstanding any language contained in such proposal, purporting to state the proposal is not a counter offer. Okay, it walks like a duck and talks like a duck, it's a duck. If you make changes under paragraph C, no matter what your attorney says, it's a counter off. Plain and simple. The intent here is only to be making changes under paragraph C that you might be willing to lose the property for. Okay? Um, so those are paragraph C modifications. Paragraph D. And, and if no agreement is made on paragraph C modifications, the contract's terminated, okay? Modifications under paragraph D, we call those proposals, and these would not rise to the same level of significance. Um, buyer wants the dining room chandelier. Seller said no once already. Buyer really wants the dining room chandelier, so asks for it again. Under paragraph D, if the seller says no, the contract stands and the provision um, falls. What often happens under paragraph D, the attorneys tell me, is they don't respond at all to paragraph D request, feeling that they're not obligated to do so. On line 152, uh, I want to talk about um, notice of termination. If notice of termination is given, said termination shall be absolute and the contract rendered null and void upon the giving of notice, notwithstanding any language proffered by any party purporting to permit unilateral reinstatement by withdrawal of any proposal. Huh? All right, what we're saying is if it, once it's terminated, it can't be resurrected. You don't get a do-over. The only way you get a do-over is to start over. Okay. So termination, done is done. We've added at 155 um, a waiver of professional inspection. So we all know that buyers have the right to perform uh, any type of inspections that they want, they have a defined time frame to do that. We've now given them the option of waiving those inspections. We're not necessarily recommending that they waive inspections, but we're giving them that opportunity. Now, they were doing it anyway, but the way they were doing it before was they were crossing it out on the contract and everyone had to initial. Now we're making it clear what the intention is. Uh, why would a person waive inspection? 
well, maybe you're going to tear it down so you don't care. Uh, maybe you're in a multiple offer situation and you don't want to risk losing the property. So you're going to waive inspection as a way to protect your position in the property. So that's new ground. Now, in professional inspections, we've added at line 162, uh, into 162, 163, and a little on 164, uh, the seller has to make all the areas of the real estate accessible for inspection upon reasonable notice and have all the utilities turned on during the time of such inspection. If we're doing a home inspection and the water's turned off, it's hard to check the plumbing. Right? If you have boxes piled to the ceiling um, in the area of the attic access, <clears throat> Uh, those have to be moved so the inspector can get in. Otherwise, the inspector is going to say those areas were not accessible. And they're going to want to go back. So we're just making clear the seller's obligation when inspections take place. Now at 171, we're trying again um, to clarify what is or is not appropriate to raise under home inspection. All right, minor repairs, routine maintenance items, and painting, decorating, or other items of cosmetic nature, no matter the cost to remedy, do not constitute defects. Okay, I'm gonna read it again because some of you don't get it. Minor repairs. Routine maintenance and painting, decorating, or other items of a cosmetic nature, no matter the cost to remedy same, do not constitute the defects and are not a part of this contingency and shall not be a basis for the buyer to cancel this contract. Now, I understand that your buyers have their own ideas about what they want to ask for. Uh, it is your obligation, though, to tell them that the contract doesn't support some of those requests. So we've given you the language here to make it clear. You will refer to the contract and you'll say, I understand that you want them to repaint the entire main floor. We can ask for that, but if they say no, the contract doesn't support our request. A request by buyer for credits or repairs in violation of the terms of this subparagraph shall allow the seller to, dec to declare this contract terminated and direct the return of buyer's earnest money. Okay? That's in the heavy black print so that you would pay a special attention to. Moving to page five. Um, this is um, something that was in 6.1. I'm on line 178. Um, but people didn't follow this. Um, buyer shall not send any portion of the inspection report with the notice provided under this subparagraph unless such inspection report or any part thereof is specifically requested in writing by the seller or seller's attorney. Hmm. Now, remember, there are 20 people on this committee. We didn't all agree on some of these things. Um, I personally feel if you're going to ask my seller um, to give you a credit or to make repairs, my seller is going to want to see what the problem was, want to see that it was referenced by the inspector. I think, though, this language is here because the tendency was when the buyer's attorney received the home inspection report, he sent the entire report on to the seller's side. Okay? And so the seller didn't need to have knowledge of all these things you weren't asking for. I think buyers did it partly too because look, it, there were 86 things in this inspection and I'm asking for four. I just think that's why it happened. But um, the contract says you're not going to send them unless they're specifically requested. 
Now I'm going to move to the bottom of the page to line 216. Um, under con uh, condominium common interest association, in that paragraph on line 216, it used to say sellers shall within five business days from date of acceptance. We've now made it 10, uh, and that was to apply for those items of disclosure that uh, were requested or required under the law. Uh, the 10 business days was was changed with the thought that by then you've been through home inspection and you know whether the buyer is planning to proceed with the purchase. Moving to page six, uh, line 242. Um, this deals with municipal transfer tax. And you all know that some communities have municipal transfer taxes, that it varies whether those taxes are paid for by the buyer or the seller. Um, the contract says that the, that the taxes will be paid by the party who is designated under the ordinance unless otherwise agreed by the party. So you might have an arrangement where the buyer is picking up all the municipal transfer taxes. Um, my next item is on line 250 under title, and this is an interesting addition. It says on line 260, okay, so we all know it's the seller's obligation to provide clear title to the property, and that he does that by having a title, a commitment for title insurance issued. Um, Some of the attorneys felt that the contract didn't state that the policy had to be issued. So we've added language that says, shall cause a title policy to be issued with an effective date as of close. Not something we really need to worry about. I'm moving to page seven. And on, uh, and we're talking, I'm, I'm looking at seller's representation. And what we've done here, we haven't added material. We've reconfigured it a little, and we've asked for the, for the initials of the parties at two more places. So on lines 297 and 299. We've done that because we've had some issues here. All right, so on 297, there are or are not improvements to the real estate which are not included in the full determination of the most recent tax assessment. Okay, we want, we particularly want the seller signing and initialing off on that. Okay, and there are or are not improvements to the real estate which are eligible for the home improvement tax exemption. Once again, we want the seller initialing off. Now what's gonna happen here is, as a buyer's agent, you're writing this document. When you write it, unless you have specific knowledge otherwise, you're going to mark are not and is not. And what this is then gonna cause is for the seller to make that change is to create that awareness. We don't want that coming at the last minute, and and we don't want the seller saying, "Oh, I didn't know, I didn't, I didn't realize I was signing off. I didn't realize that was part of the contract." Going to initial off on it now. So just for clarification, moving to page eight, I'm going to talk about business days and business hours. And, and what happens. So on line 318, in the event the closing or loan contingency date described in this contract does not fall on a business day. Why would that be? Well, when we looked at the, con when we looked at the calendar, we didn't look carefully, or we didn't look at the calendar at all, and we chose a Saturday or Sunday. Oops, all right, well, if that happens, the date shall be the next business day. 
in paragraph 25, we've changed the title to this paragraph, and we now, um, in in light of the times, we now say electronic or digital signatures. I think it said facsimile or digital signatures before. Uh, on line 321, we've we've always known that we could execute, we could negotiate, and we could finalize. Well, now we can also amend. Right. Um, the uh, on line 23 and 24, we added, we substituted facsimile, uh, electronic means for facsimile. Uh, all right, next, I'm on page nine. Um, now, we added on line 351, by mailing to the addresses recited herein on page 13. Now, I'm going to talk about this. We've made the addresses of the parties a requirement on page 13. And I'm going to go, I'm going to, and we're going to talk about it again when we get to page 13. But I'm going to go down here to line 363, and I'm going to give you an incentive for getting that information on page 13. And here it comes on line 363. If a party fails to provide contact information herein as required, notice may be served upon the party's designated agent in any of the manners provided above. Designated agent, that's you. So if you don't get that information on the contract, you very well could be the person receiving notice. That's not a position your managing broker will want you to be in, probably not a position you want to be in either. The way to avoid that is make sure you have this information on the contract. All right, then we added, we're always hopeful here, on line 365. The party serving the notice shall provide courtesy copies to the party's designated agent. Failure to provide such courtesy copies shall not render the notice invalid. You know, it just makes sense. You want to keep everyone in the loop. We want everyone to know what's happening. Now, good news as it relates to, um, it used to be called paragraph 32, it's now called paragraph 30, the sale of the buyer's real estate. We made no significant changes to that paragraph, which runs two pages. But we did, um, because of the private network, on line 385, 387, and 389, we've indicated when the buyer tells us that he has or has not listed his property, we want to be clear that it's publicly listed. Right? Before, a buyer could put his listing in the private network mark that he has listed his property for sale. We're just wanting to clarify that. As a seller, I want to know if it's in the private network or if it's out there for everyone to see. No changes on page 10. Flying right away. Moving to page 11. Um, Line 472, this used to say post-closing possession. Now, I'm embarrassed to tell you, but there were some agents who didn't know what post-closing possession meant. And there might have been some attorneys, too. I don't know about that. But on our side, there were some agents who were not clear about post-closing possession. So in the interest of clarity, we now call it possession after closing. We, that's on line 472. On 473, um, we've expanded this a little bit, and it now says possession shall be delivered no later than 11.59 p.m. on the date that is, check one, blank days after the date of closing, or you insert the date. 
now uh, on line 476, we used to say um, that the escrow would be 1% of the purchase price if you left that line blank. It's now 2%. So don't leave lines blank. Should be a message. Um, I'm going to move now to page 12, as is condition. Um, line 496 and 497 <clears throat> indicate that nothing in this paragraph shall prohibit the exercise of the rights of buyer in paragraph 33 if applicable. Now, paragraph 33 is the well and septic inspection. So, the seller would still have the obligation to provide a well and septic report to the buyer. We wanted to clarify that because some sellers were saying it's as is, I don't have to do it. Um, next, I'm on line 503, and this says attachment. Um, this is the line that previously came just before optional provisions in the 6.1. And um, this is not the place where you write a book. It says attachments. You would attach um, VA certification, uh, FHA forms, um, uh, relocation uh, addendum, okay, that type of thing. Remember, uh, and many of you won't remember this, but in the 1960s, there was a large real estate company in the Chicago area called Quinlan Tyson. And um, uh, the Chicago Bar Association felt that Quinlan, uh, Quinlan Tyson and probably other real estate companies as well uh, were exceeding the boundaries of what they could appropriately, should appropriately do in real estate transactions. So litigation ensued and the court determined that what we as real estate practitioners may appropriately do is fill in the blanks in forms customarily used in our area. Uh, we can make deletions, uh, and we can fill in the blank. Doesn't say we can write an epistle. Um, so keep in mind, uh, if there are things that you think need to in go into the contract, let the buyer's attorney know. Uh, let the agent on the other side know. I think we need some additional language here. I'm going to ask our attorney to prepare that. Just a good way to keep out of trouble. Um, so, the following attachments, if any, are hereby incorporated into this contract. Additional documents, okay, that you're going to attach. That's what that's for. Um, miscellaneous provisions. Uh, line 512, ringing across. Multi-unit, four units or fewer. We've added a multi-unit addendum. Um, and uh, an attorney may need to write an expanded document from that. Um, we've taken interest-bearing account, which was an optional provision before. We've moved it to miscellaneous provisions because, first, interest rates are so low that no one was using that provision anyway. And secondarily, brokers were charging as much as $100 to establish these accounts. So you get $4.32 interest, and it costs $100 to open the account. You don't have to be Einstein to figure out that doesn't work. So optional provision. If you've taken um, an excessively large amount of earnest money, and the closing is a long way off, and you need that provision, you're going to mark it there, and then a document will be prepared. We've also added lease purchase. Good news, page 13 is the end. All right, I want to start on, five, on line 513. The 
the parties acknowledge that this contract shall be governed by the laws of the state of Illinois and is subject to the covenant of good faith and fair dealing implied in all real in all Illinois contracts. That's a really important couple of lines. And we thought it was so important that a good part of the committee felt it should be at the very beginning of the contract. Uh, it was decided to put it here because this you're going to make sure that the client reads this before signing. Okay? What it says is what we're doing here, you have to be doing in good faith. And you're governed by the laws of the state of Illinois. So making six offers on a piece of property on one day and just seeing which one is going to stick, that's probably not acting in good faith. Just a thought. Um, now I've already mentioned to you on line 527 and 529, we've added the requirement for the addresses for each of the parties. Please make every effort to get this. Uh, if you're using uh, if you're using the uh, sale of the buyer's residence as a part of this contract and you don't put a contact uh, address, you know you are going to be the one that has to reach that person. So think about that. Um, that's all I have to say about the contract itself. Uh, I am going to take a moment just to go through the addendum. Um, do you have to do, are there questions that I need to answer? Or Probably a good time to answer some of those. Okay, um, we'll give it a shot. I think someone might get answered in the addendum conversation, but the first one was asked regarding line 53, what if the buyer of a multi-unit property wants the existing tenants to stay and not vacate the property? Where can that be indicated on the contract? I guess is for coming to that one. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and I think we are, but it would be, um, you know, to be subject to existing leases and tenancies anyway. And then I think you want to make sure that the attorney addresses that. There's only so much that we can do in these documents. Perfect. Um, next one would be uh, kind of all they fit kind of on the same lines on line 171. Have we defined minor repairs? And people have given a lot of different examples, like broken window seals. Is that considered cosmetic? Um, different things, soot, things like that. So, have we done something along the lines to identify what a minor repair is? Or again, is that going to kind of be attorney discussion? Um, I think part of it is going to be the attorney thing. You know, common sense here. Um, if you're looking at a property and the window is clouded. Uh, you pretty much know the seal is broken. You know that going in. You can raise it in the home inspection and see where it goes. And, you know, this this document is market driven. So if you're in a popular price range and there are people, other people standing in line to buy this house, you might think twice about whether you're going to make, you're going to consider that a major component, you know. Um, the goal in that provision, it says, if a component provides the function for which it was intended, regardless of age, it's doing its job. So if the window isn't broken, um, you know, I don't know that I think you're going to get a new window. You can request it, but just realize you're not on real solid ground. Um, so that just reiterates one thing. So simply asking for something cosmetic can void the contract if it's requested? Absolutely. Yep. Absolutely. We had an instance on a $150,000 condo where the buyer asked for $20,000 decorating allowance. Really? That didn't go anywhere. That got canceled right away and buyer number two had a much more realistic approach. Um, Line 299, tax prorations. Okay. If the seller rehabs a property and the property has not been reassessed yet, would this cause the seller to say yes to that part? Yes. Um, 
And and if the seller has rehabbed the property, someone else asked me this question. We do have another provision in this contract where properties have been uh, rebuilt and haven't been assessed and uh, a, a percentage is held at the time of the closing because the property has not yet been reassessed. And then the last question that I'm seeing here, well, I got two more questions. Last one I'm seeing here is um, during the attorney review, quite a few attorneys would strike and make changes to the 6.1 contract. If they continue to do this, could this be considered a counter offer with the new contract? Yes. Yes. And you know, the irony is that the attorneys who sit on this committee felt that having that the option of the serious provisions and the frivolous uh, was an important distinction because the attorneys didn't want to be deal killers. They wanted to be able to segregate out what you're willing to die for in this and the purchase of this property and what you're not. And so they've given you that option. Now, the attorneys who don't regularly practice real estate, they just right away cross out D and everything becomes a C. Well, everything under C is a counter offer. So you put your client at risk. So I have a question that's going to page one. I don't know if they're going to ask a question or not yet on that. The last thing, um, the question has happened quite a bit. And I don't know if this is necessarily a care question or if this is going to be a Fox Valley question. But I've had several requests throughout this to get this copy. Do we have a solution in place? I, mean, I know you sent me a link. Uh, a mark kind of copy? Right. I'm for I'm for everybody having that copy. Yeah, we can send that. I will send that out to all the attendees. Right. So yeah, for anybody that have asked that question, we will send out the the attendees. For the one that asked us, hold the page one. We'll leave it for a couple seconds. If you have a question, um, we'll wait. If not, then we'll probably move on. And we can come back. And come back to whatever questions you have. But thanks, everybody. I do appreciate the questions. They have been awesome. And then we're going to move on to the addendum. They're good, so we can move on. Yeah, as we well, I just close your eyes for a second. I don't want anybody getting dizzy with us. Oh. We might we might have been dizzy to start with. <laughs> okay. 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 Mutual cancellation. All right. This is not a new form. <clears throat> the format is a little different. We've taken out um, the reasons for the cancellation. Um, you know, before it said inability to satisfy contingency provided in paragraph blank. We took that out because we didn't want the client to be placed in jeopardy because you marked the wrong paragraph. So now what it says is it's agreed that the contract is null and void. Doesn't talk about why. It's just agreed. The disbursement of the earnest money is subject to the written direction of the seller and the buyer only or as otherwise provided by law and not upon the oral or written direction of the real estate professionals involved in the transaction. Okay. Most real estate companies are not going to release earnest money without the signatures of both parties. Okay. It's not going to be the, the attorney said it's okay. The attorney sent an email. It's okay to return the money. That's not going to work. So, you're going to have it signed by the parties. Um, it talks about how the money is being apportioned, and it has the addresses for the party. Okay? So some changes to that form. What do you have next? Okay. This is a new document. I'm not going to review this document with you. Um, if you're... If it applies to your situation, you're going to read through it. Um, you're going to use it accordingly. Okay. But that's, that's new. Um, it expands the use of the residential contract. I think here in the Fox Valley, we have a multi-unit con um, multi contract, which you might have used instead of using the 7.0. Okay. Uh, uh, short sale addendum. Good news. I think most of us would agree. Not as many short sales now as there were a few years back. Uh, the only change we made in this document, 
occurs on line 23. And I get used to say, if blank, then, a, then 90 days. Uh, rarely, and what this does is it commits the buyer, it commits the parties to this contract for a period of, in this case, 120 days if you leave it blank. 90 days wasn't a realistic expectation. Uh, buyers, agents used to like to write things like 30 days. You want to say, really? Um, but the idea here is to set the expectation at the outset that this could take some time uh, and that everyone is aware of that. So that was the only change there. Okay, this is a new form. Um, this comes, this is an expansion. So this is called paragraph 30 notice and response form. It's an expansion of what was before in the amended notice and response form. If you're writing contingent contracts, it's incumbent upon you to become familiar with this form. More than likely, if you are the seller's agent, you are the person who's going to be serving this notice on the buyer. Okay. That's why it's important for you to know where the buyer is. The reference to line to page 13 and the required address. Now, does it mean that it's going to be the agent? No, not necessarily. But it's the most expeditious way to get notice served. Now, I'm the listing agent. I have a contingent contract on one of my listings. I now have buyer B, and I want to make buyer B's contract effective as quickly as possible. If you don't personally serve this notice, which is what this form enables you to do, the attorney can do it by um, certified mail, he can do it by regular mail, but we're talking about extended periods of time for those things. Okay, The notice doesn't become effective uh, until it's served. And if you're doing it by mail, it's a couple of days. So you serve it, you have the buyer sign it, date it with the date and the time. When you're doing this, you have a couple of copies with you, you leave a copy with the buyer, you take a signed copy when you leave. Okay. Might be a reason you won't want to be writing too many of these. But um, that obligation was always there. We're just defining it. We're fleshing it out. Okay, and so the amendment notice and response form is what it was before, but now without the paragraph 30 information. Perfect time. So I'm done. Perfect. When I've done this in the past, I say applause now. Yeah. Uh, we do have one more question. I forgot to ask, I apologize. Uh, what happens in the event of a vacant home where sellers will not be turning on the utilities? We're doing a home inspection with space controls. We have to. What happens if they say no? Okay. Um, uh, and they won't turn them on. Well, what we did when we had these situations in the foreclosure properties is the buyer can have the utilities turned on. He can. Have, there's a fee usually to do that. Um, and you have to let the municipality know ahead of time. They'll send someone out to turn the utilities on for your inspection, and they'll turn them off afterward. And more than likely, that's going to be a buyer expense. Okay. Perfect. Well, if you guys have questions, we'll sit there here for a few things, but it's pretty much the top of the hour. Pretty much couldn't have done much better for timing than what we did. Um, so appreciate everybody for being there. We had looked like at the highest number. We had about 110 show up. So that was an awesome turnout. Thanks everybody for showing up. Thanks Carol for doing an amazing job. Thanks for Association for letting us do this. I think this was an amazing thing. Hopefully we got a lot from this guys. Um, and if you have questions, call. ask, call. That's what attorneys are for. That's <laughs> me being a smart aleck. So. Uh,
So that's it, guys. If you want to, that's what we have. Thanks for everything, and uh, have a good day. Good luck with the contract. Bye, everybody. Perfect. Sure, I have I have a question. Just uh, sure. Sure.